There are uh, many questions that uh, one can ask about language. The most fundamental one, surely, is uh, what it is. So what is language? To the extent that you have some grasp of this, uh, one can proceed to investigate uh, other questions. But lacking that, uh, inquiry is necessarily curtailed. Uh, for example, no biologist would uh, seek to study the uh, development or the evolution of the eye uh, without a fairly clear conception of uh, what an eye is, of its essential nature. So it would not do, for example, to say that uh, it's used to read uh, or for language that uh, it's used to communicate among numerous other uses. Uh, on the basis of a tentative account of what language is, and the more far-reaching the better, uh, we can proceed to uh, ask how the uh, concepts, principles, uh, and results of this uh, characterization of language inform uh, other inquiries, the study of acquisition, uh, use, uh, neural representation, historical change, uh, evolution, and, uh, and others. Uh, reciprocally, what's learned about these topics can lead to uh, recasting the basic theory that was proposed. The logical hierarchy of questions does not, of course, uh, determine the course of inquiry. Uh, every sensible approach to language must recognize at least that it's used by individuals, uh, and that that capacity to use it depends primarily on properties of the human brain. Uh, that much should be uncontroversial. Uh, accordingly, every approach to language, uh, no matter what it is, uh, presupposes, at least tacitly, a concept that is sometimes called uh, I language, I for internal individual, uh, some system that's internal to an individual and understood as a biological uh, uh, property of the person. Uh, while that uh, is presupposed by all sensible conceptions, uh, whether it's acknowledged or not, uh, often vigorously denied, but nevertheless it has to be accepted, uh, I language itself presupposes none of the others. Uh, and in that sense, it's the most fundamental notion. And when I speak of language here, I'll mean high language in that sense, uh, something internal to an individual and a biological object, uh, property mostly of the brain. Well, the most elementary property of high language is that it's a system of uh, technically called discrete infinity, rather like the integers. So, there's six and there's seven, but six and a half isn't an integer. Uh, a system of that kind has to be determined by some finite computational procedure. In technical terms, it's called a generative procedure, which is a special kind of uh, recursive function. The, uh, uh, the, the, so, so the study of I language is uh, its core notion is some kind of recursion. Recursion is a concept that's often misinterpreted, in fact, almost universal outside of mathematics, but I won't go into that here. I'll put it aside. The linguistic and psychological literature is rife with misinterpretations, uh, but it's pretty simple. Basically, a recursive function is anything that you can program for your laptop. That's good enough as long as the laptop has a capacity to add memory indefinitely. So you can put more and more disks into it. That's a recursive function. Uh, for example, a program to add numbers. Or if we understood enough uh, to generate the expressions of uh, the various I languages. And in fact, each I language can be understood to be just a generative procedure, uh, which yields an unbounded array of uh, hierarchically structured expressions, uh, each of which is assigned an, inter an interpretation at 
the interfaces with other uh, internal systems. Uh, one is the sensory motor system that can be externalized in some form. Uh, another is, uh, roughly speaking, a semantic pragmatic system thought, roughly. So that means an eye language basically is something that associates sound and meaning, a traditional notion that goes back to classical antiquity. We now know that sound is only one mode of sensory motor externalization. It turns out there's nothing special about it, but I'll keep the sound just for convenience. Well, the fact that the sound meaning correlation uh, is in principle unbounded has very rarely been recognized in the long and uh, rich history of the study of language. In fact, it only found a few cases. Uh, Darwin was one. He wrote that man differs from animals solely in his almost infinitely larger power of associating the most diversified sounds and ideas. That is, in having a, what we would now call a generative grammar. Uh, the phrase almost infinite is a traditional phrase that is understood ambiguously as meaning very large or infinite. Distinction was not clearly made until more recently. Uh, the unbounded character of the association is the basis for what uh, Galileo called, uh, quoting him, the marvelous invention of the alphabet, which in his words, provides the means to construct from 25 or 30 sounds that infinity of expressions that enable us to reveal everything that we think and all the movements of our soul. It's a correct characterization and a rare one. Uh, recognition of the unbounded character of the language and the deeper concern, much deeper concern for the uh, creative character of its normal use, uh, that was soon to become a, a core feature of uh, Cartesian science, what we call philosophy. Uh, coming to more recent times, uh, a century ago, a prominent linguist, uh, Otto Jespersen, erased the question how the elements of language come into existence in the mind of a speaker on the basis of obviously finite experience. That's the problem of acquisition. And that process, again quoting Jesperson, yields somehow a notion of structure in the mind of the speaker that is definite enough to guide him in framing sentences of his own uh, crucially free expressions that are typically new to speaker and hearer uh, over an unbounded range. And it would therefore follow that the task of the science of language is to discover this notion of structure, uh, how it arises in the mind, and to go beyond that uh, to unearth what Jesperson calls the great principles underlying the grammars of all languages, and by so doing, to gain a deeper insight into the innermost nature of human language and of human thought. Now, these are ideas that sound much less strange today than they did when Lyle and I were getting into the game uh, during the structuralist, uh, behaviorist, behavioral science era that uh, came to dominate most of the field almost 100%. That marginalized uh, Jesperson's insights. In fact, he was forgotten for years. And I don't know about you, I was a, we were both students at the same university studying linguistics at uh, different years. And I never heard Jesperson's name mentioned. I learned about him poking around in the library once. Uh, and along with much other traditional understanding, it was just forgotten and regarded as mystical because it didn't fit the behavioral science preconceptions. Uh, well, reformulating Jesperson's program, which I think is the right one, uh, the basic task is to investigate the true nature of the interfaces, sensory motor, uh, semantic pragmatic, uh, and the generative procedures that relate them 
uh, and to determine how they arise in the mind of the speaker and how they're used. Uh, the focus of concern should naturally be on free expressions, the creative character of the mind, uh, along with further questions about uh, uh, neural representation, uh, evolution, and much else. Uh, well, the modern sciences generally have uh, largely adopted uh, Galileo's methodological guideline, uh, which is that the, in his view, that, that nature is simple. It keeps to what he called the easiest and simplest rules. And the task of the scientist uh, then is to try to demonstrate this fact as fully as possible and to show that the observed variety and diversity of phenomena is only a superficial manifestation of deeper principles that we have to somehow try to unearth. The physicist uh, Jean-Baptiste Perrin put the matter in his Nobel Prize lecture this way. He said the essential art of science is reduction of complex visibles to simple invisibles. Uh, these have been quite useful guidelines uh, for the study of language as well. Well, for language then, it, uh, the task is to determine how closely language approximates what we might call minimal recursion, optimal recursive operations, and, how, and to do so within the boundary conditions that are set by the interface conditions, which come from outside language. Uh, that's why a recent uh, collection of technical essays has the title, Interface, Interfaces plus Recursion equals Language, and followed by a big question mark, uh, because there's so much that's not understood, not surprisingly. Uh, in the early days of modern generative grammar, 50, 60 years ago, it seemed that uh, highly complex and intricate assumptions were needed uh, to account for the variety of linguistic data. Uh, it also seemed that languages could differ in almost every imaginable way, although it was recognized that this could not possibly be true, or else uh, no language could ever be acquired by a child. Incidentally, rather similar views were held by biologists about the variety of organisms that could be anything imaginable over the years that's turned out with very narrow, limited restrictions. In fact, so narrow that uh, a proposal that there's a universal genome that all multicellular animals are fundamentally identical is taken seriously, it can't be proven, but plausible. Uh, well, uh, over the years, something similar has happened in the the study of language, it's been shown, I think, convincingly, that the, uh, a good deal of the complexity uh, can be stripped away, and that the variety of languages is quite narrowly constrained, much more so than appeared to be the case. Uh, in recent years, uh, the study of the inquiry into this topic has gotten a different name. It's been called the Minimalist Program. It's the phrase in the title, uh, but that's not a sharp departure from what preceded. Uh, on the contrary, it's a seamless continuation of the effort to show that uh, if we can gain a proper perspective, a proper point of view on language, uh, it will be seen to be fundamentally simple, following the simplest rules, uh, like other, many other aspects of nature that seem hopelessly complex and vary when they're not understood. Uh, the minimalist program does introduce some new research suggestions. Uh, one of them is to take as a starting point uh, what's sometimes called the strong minimalist thesis. Uh, the idea is first postulate what the simplest theory of eye language would be, and then ask, the, take a look at the innumerable apparent departures from this and try to show that they're misunderstood, that uh, if they can be uh, understood within a different perspective, then they'll be shown to fall within a 
principle, simple framework of uh, principles. Now that, I think, has been quite a productive research program, um, although, uh, needless to say, a great deal remains unexplained. Uh, the uh, strong minimalist thesis looks far more plausible than it seemed to be not too many years ago, and it also has some interesting implications about the nature of language and its acquisition. I'll mention a few of these as I go on. Well, uh, let's turn now to language acquisition. Uh, that's the development of an organic system, and like the development of any other organic system, it involves uh, several factors. Uh, one factor is external data. So any organic system, say the visual system, will, its development will take various forms depending on what the external data is. It's known experimentally that it can be radically changed in mammals by very early uh, intervention. Uh, so one factor, of course, is external data. Uh, the second factor is genetic endowment. An organism has to be prepared to develop in a certain way. And a third factor is uh, uh, more general principles, physical laws, uh, uh, conditions that growth and development have to meet. And so, for example, it's the fact that cells divide into spheres is not because of genetic endowment or experience. It's for principles of physics, really. So it just has to happen that way. They can't divide into cubes. Uh, the, uh, these, uh, uh, the existence of these factors uh, is regarded as uncontentious. Uh, it's only among the genetic factors. There are several. Uh, one are those that are specific to language. That's what's technically now called UG, universal grammar. It's adapting a traditional term to quite a new context. Uh, and then the genetic basis for whatever other systems of uh, the mind, cognitive processes, the brain, and so on might enter into, uh, might interact to lead to the way language is acquired. Well, existence of these factors is regarded as quite uncontentious, with a single exception, uh, UG, that's considered contentious, uh, which is very irrational in my view. That has to be a misunderstanding. It's evident that there must be a genetic basis for the fact that, uh, as Jacques described before, a uh, human infant, but no other organism, uh, infinitely, uh, instantaneously, and effortlessly, uh, reflexively extricates from the environment language-relevant data, and no small trick, incidentally. And it quickly attains rich linguistic competence and feats that are utterly beyond any other organism, even in their most rudimentary aspects. But that's what would be entailed by denying the existence of universal grammar. Now, there are other approaches that are commonly advocated, like astronomical memory. But you just do a small calculation, it turns out memory will have to be bigger than the number of particles in the universe, even to deal with small sentences. Uh, statistical analysis, very popular, uh, or sometimes what's called theory of mind, that is, the ability to recognize that uh, other people have a perspective different than you do, uh, sometimes culture in some obscure sense, sense that gives a bad name to hand-waving, I should say. Uh, but all of these collapse very quickly uh, on any serious analysis. In fact, I think it seems well established. Uh, quote, Susan Curtis has done a lot of pioneering work in establishing the conclusions. Uh, uh, she concludes, and I think correctly, that language represents a domain specific mental faculty, one that rests on structural organizing principles and constraints not shared in large part by other mental faculties. And furthermore, in its Processing and computation is automatic and mandatory, not in its use, notice, but in its processing and computation. And she's reviewing work on uh, 
of dissociations or multiple dissociations of human language capacity from other capacities in both directions and uh, other evidence. Uh, notice again that it's the processing and uh, computation that are automatic and mandatory. Uh, the normal use of language extends far beyond these limits, and uh, there's no reason today to doubt the fundamental of insight of Descartes, one of the foundations of Cartesian science, uh, namely that uh, use of language has a creative character. Uh, normally, typically, it's innovative uh, without bounds. Uh, it's appropriate to circumstances, but not caused by circumstances, uh, or as far as it is known, caused by internal states. Uh, and it can engender thoughts in others that they recognize they could have formulated themselves. Uh, those are very mysterious properties, but uh, very hard to question. Uh, there's also a by now famous uh, aphorism of Wil Wilhelm von Humboldt, uh, namely that language involves infinite use of finite means, but it's often overlooked that he was referring to use. Uh, that's a mystery. Uh, the means, we can, we've made considerable progress in understanding what the means are, but uh, uh, the use, the ability to use it in a, use them in a creative way remains, uh, for now, an impenetrable mystery, maybe forever. It goes back to questions of free will and choice quite generally. Uh, the rejection of universal grammar is sometimes based on a confusion of universal grammar, which is just the genetic basis for uh, eye language, confusing that with linguistic universals. That's quite a different notion. Uh, this important work on linguistic universals, the best known as uh, linguist uh, Joseph Greenberg's uh, very important compilation. Uh, these are generalizations, uh, meaning that they're expected. They'll probably have exceptions. Uh, UG does not have exceptions, except in the case of pathology. For normal humans, UG is fixed in various single genetic basis. Uh, that's not insignificant. Uh, one reason is that it tells us that uh, it tells us at least something about the evolution of language. And in fact, there's precious little to add of any substance. Huge literature growing exponentially, but based on literally nothing, except the fact, except one fact which isn't usually recognized, and namely that there has been essentially no evolution of uh, the language capacity, at least in the 50,000 years roughly since uh, our ancestors began to leave Africa. So if you take an infant in an Amazonian tribe, uh, which has had no other human contact for as long back as you like, uh, they instantaneously learn Portuguese, just like any other child. And if they're such an infant were brought to Trieste, it would speak like any native of Trieste, and conversely. Uh, and uh, as far as there aren't any exceptions known to this, and if that's correct, and, uh, and the evidence is quite overwhelming, then it means that the linguistic capacity, UG, simply hasn't changed. Uh, in fact, the only other fact about evolution that's known with even limited confidence is that if you go back not long before that, maybe another 50,000 years, there's no evidence that there's any language at all. So during that extremely narrow window, from an evolutionary point of view, it's a flick of an eye, uh, something happened uh, which led to these creative capacities. And that, again, leads us to expect that Galileo is probably right. It must have been something simple that happened some simple rewiring of the brain. Uh, maybe the rewiring that created the generative capacity, which doesn't seem to exist anywhere else in the organic world. And that's about what you can say about evolution of language. I don't know anything else that can be said. Plenty is written, but... <laughs>
having something to say is different from writing. Uh, the, uh, uh, all of this is pretty surprising to people who believe in a certain conception of evolution, what sometimes you're taught in school, uh, but a serious misunderstanding of the modern theory of evolution. Uh, that is the idea that uh, the language must have evolved in small steps over a long period. You know, that evolution takes place in little bits. I mean, Darwin did believe that, but for a long time it's been known to be completely wrong. Uh, however, uh, these assumptions uh, that I mentioned are uh, quite consistent with the conclusion, I think a lot more plausible, that the core properties of uh, language uh, emerge fairly suddenly uh, uh, in evolutionary time, uh, probably by some uh, minor mutation which rewired the brain. Well, of course, there's constant historical change, but that's a totally different matter. Uh, historical change is not to be confused with evolution. Uh, this should be obvious, and the only reason I say it is because it's commonly overlooked. If you look at the literature on evolution of language, it's mostly speculation about historical change. Uh, it, in the technical sense of the word evolution, Languages don't evolve at all, uh, so there is no such field as evolution of language, no topic. They do change over time, but they don't evolve. Uh, language users evolve their organisms. But with regard to language capacity, not in the last 50,000 years, it seems, and possibly not since the emergence of cognitively modern humans, apparently, not long before they began to leave Africa. Anatomically modern humans go back uh, hundreds of thousands of years. You can tell that from fossil evidence. But cognitively modern humans, as far as you can tell from archeological evidence, seem to be very recent, very shortly before the trek from Africa. Uh, the, uh, well, let's turn to language acquisition. Uh, even the first moment, raise very puzzling questions. Uh, an infant is surrounded by what famous psychologist William James called a blooming, buzzing confusion. Just a lot of stuff happening. Uh, somehow the infant must extract from this confusion data that are specific to language. Uh, not easy to you know, try to write a some kind of mechanical procedure that will do that. It's uh, quite mysterious. There's very recent evidence that the auditory system of apes, chimpanzees, is, is very similar to that of humans. And it even responds to the acoustic, to acoustic signals that are critical for human language, so-called distinctive features. But for apes, this is just noise. Uh, it's just an undifferentiated part of the general physical environment, and that's true of other organisms. Although they pick out specific parts of the environment that are ignored or undetected, maybe undetectable by humans. Uh, so there's got to be some uh, specific internal computational mechanism that's used by human infants, but uh, not other organisms, to take the very first step in language acquisition to determine that something out there is related to language. Uh, research by Jacques Miller and his colleagues has shown that this achievement is in part prenatal. That means a newborn infant can distinguish the language of its mother from certain other languages, both spoken by a woman's voice that it's never heard before. And it turns out that uh, research that came out of these surprising discoveries has shown that languages fall into rather plausible categories in this regard, what, you can, what the infant can distinguish and what it can't. Uh, it's mostly based on what are called prosodic features of rhythm, pitch, stress, and so on, which are specific to languages in various ways. Well, after the first instant, uh, acquisition follows quite a regular course. 
And by about six months, the children can normally master the specific prosodic system of the language spoken around them. And a few months later, they, nine, ten months, they discard phonetic distinctions that the language doesn't use. Uh, in actuality, there are typically s several such languages, but I'll put it aside. Uh, uh, meanwhile, uh, children are doing something else that's equally miraculous. They're acquiring the meaning of words at an extraordinary rate, uh, up to one word an hour, a waking hour at peak periods of language growth. And this is, again, quite a remarkable achievement. It's the mystery is considerably obscured by a conventional illusion that words relate directly to things or events. So we make nouns, name, objects, uh, verbs, refer to states, or events, and so on. But something like that does appear to be true for animal symbolic systems. So for example, the, say a verbit monkey may have five calls, uh, one of them we interpret as a warning call. It's apparently reflexively triggered by leaves moving in a certain way. So uh, an eagle's coming, get out of the way. Uh, or another call might uh, be triggered by some internal hormonal condition, which we take to mean I'm hungry or something. Uh, and that appears to be exceptionless. As far as is known, all animal symbolic systems are like this, a one-to-one -one association between the symbol and some physically detectable configuration and probably reflexively produced. Uh, but nothing remotely of the sort is true for human language. You take a look at even the simplest words, like water, river, tree, person, uh, house, uh, anything you think of, in every case that's been looked at with any care, it can very easily be shown that they, they do not pick out physically identifiable configurations. Uh, uh, there's no reference or denotation relation in the technical sense of uh, philosophy, linguistics, psychology. They're used to refer, but using an expression to refer is very different from saying that the term itself has a reference, a fixed, determinate, physically identifiable configuration that it relates to that simply isn't true. Uh, referring is an action uh, which has to be dis distinguished sharply from reference, a relation between a word and a thing. That does not seem to exist for human language, quite contrary to conventional doctrine Although the point was re reasonably understood long ago, uh, back to Aristotle, in fact. So persons, for example, are individuated by properties such as psychic continuity. Uh, it's not a physical property. And physicists can't identify psychic continuity. It's an interpretation of the world that's imposed by our modes of cognition, our ways of thinking about things. These are facts that were studied quite interestingly in the 17th century. John Locke and others uh, later adapted by Kant and understood by every infant. Uh, you can, for example, uh, the typical fairy story is based on properties like that, psychic continuity, which a child understands with no problem. And in fact, every word you think of is, is like that. Uh, and what's true of simple words, of course, becomes far more mysterious when you move to complex concepts, to acquisition, or even more strikingly, to acquisition of language under uh, conditions of sensory limitations. And for example, acquisition of language uh, by the blind, who very readily achieve quite exquisite uh, understanding of words for sight, you know, look, see, glare, and so on. Uh, it's work that Lila, Lila Gleitman and Barbara, Barbara Lando have carried out, or borrow another example of 
while us to illustrate the amazing facts of language acquisition, I'm now quoting her, consider such words as fair, as in, that's not fair. She points out, that's a notion and a vocabulary item that every child with a sibling learns very quickly and in self-defense. Uh, but it's a concept of considerable subtlety. In fact, it's a centerpiece of contemporary moral philosophy. I'll try to figure out what that means. For infants, it's uh, obvious. Uh, such uh, facts like this just abound, and they pose very serious uh, mysteries, not only for the study of acquisition, but also for speculation about evolution of the human language capacity. And they haven't been addressed. And the reason is that uh, because of easy acceptance of the referentialist doctrine, the words and things doctrine, which just is false for human language. Well, even uh, for even very young uh, infants, the knowledge of language extends far beyond their performance. It's been shown experimentally by Lila and work going back 50 years and later by others. Uh, in fact, there's some evidence that by about two years old, a child may have mastered the basic rudiments of its language, although it may be producing only two-word expressions. Now, the evidence for this comes from the study of language acquisition by the blind deaf, people like Helen Keller, uh, who lost sight and hearing at about 20 months and had uh, fantastic uh, command of language, which he learned by touch. It's the only data. Uh, since there have been other cases studied, uh, mainly in work by my wife at uh, MIT in a project there, and for some of the subjects, uh, quite subtle tests were necessary to detect limits of their knowledge of English. Uh, knowledge attained is derived simply by putting their hands on someone's face, on the face and throat of a speaker. It's the total data, extremely limited data. Uh, there's one suggestive result that remained unpublished because the sample wasn't large enough. Uh, these are cases of, uh, all of these cases of loss in sight and hearing that were studied were the result of some debilitating disease that destroyed the sensory system. I think it was spinal meningitis. Uh, and in every case study, uh, uh, acquisition of language took place uh, only if the disease had struck uh, past about 18 months. Uh, meaning if you had a 16-month-old child who had the disease, they'd never acquire language. But if it was 20 months old, like say Helen Keller, they could acquire perfect knowledge of language. That pretty strongly <laughs> suggests that the basic properties of the language had already been acquired during that brief window, and they were just being elicited by the training procedures. Well, fortunately, this research can't be continued, at least in this manner, because the disease can now be cured, but maybe there's some other way to study it. Uh, one quite far-reaching thesis about language acquisition is what's called the con continuity hypothesis. It implies, I'm quoting, that children are free to try out various linguistic options compatible with universal grammar before they set the parameters that determine the language that they hear. I'm quoting Stephen Crane, done a lot of work on this. Uh, the continuity hypothesis uh, is invoked to account for the discovery by Crane and Rod, Ross Thor Thornton that uh, child language sometimes exhibits properties for which there's no evidence at all in the environment, although they're found in other languages and compatible with universal grammar. So in their experiments, uh, English-speaking children uh, sometimes follow rules of German or Italian uh, before these options are discarded, uh, very much in the way that phonetic distinctions that 
aren't used in the language uh, disappear from the child's repertoire. And as Thornton and Crane point out, uh, results like this provide a quite interesting, significant evidence about the nature of universal grammar. Well, let me try finally to draw together the two strands that I've been talking about, the minimalist program and language acquisition. Uh, clearly, the inquiry into language acquisition presupposes some concept of the target that's attained or approached, and I assume it to be an I language, although, of course, it's much more, more than that. It's also necessary to somehow at least recognize, even if we can't account for it, the mysterious uh, creative aspect of language use is the primary criterion for mind, for Descartes and his followers, and we have no real reason to question that. Well, as I already mentioned, acquisition involves three factors, uh, external data, genetic endowment, general principles. Uh, for a computational system like language, you expect that the third factor, the uh, gen general principles, uh, uh, would involve principles of efficient computation, it's a computational system. There are general principles of efficient computation. There independent of organisms and presumably invoked in the uh, development of language. Uh, the genetic component, uh, UG, that includes at least a uh, generative procedure which has to yield an unbounded array of hierarchically structured expressions uh, which can be interpreted at the interfaces. Well, any such procedure must involve an operation that takes two objects that have already been constructed and produces a new object. Let's call that operation merge. Uh, adopting the third factor principle of minimal computation, uh, we would naturally assume, to start at least, that merge is as simple as possible. Uh, that, ha that means that it leaves the two objects unordered and unchanged. Think about it, that means that merge of x and y simply yields the set x, y. Uh, that suffices to account for one crucial property, an uh, unbounded array of structured expressions, but leaves open many questions. Uh, one question, of course, is where order comes from. But the relation between instinctively and fly is not only much more natural, but it's also much more easily computable. It's just a, a matter of minimal distance. Fly is the closest word to instinctively, so the relation is very easily computable just by counting. Uh, the relation between <coughs> instinctively and swim, instinctively eagles and fly swim, it's also a minimal distance relation, but a much more complex one. It's minimal structural distance, because fly is embedded inside another phrase, so you have to search more deeply to find it. So it's minimal structural distance, uh, not minimal linear distance. Uh, nevertheless, in every language and every relevant construction, and there are a great many, the languages uniformly adopt the complex computation of structural distance and reject the simple computation of linear distance. And children know this reflexively without any evidence at all. Uh, well, that's important. Now, that's one of a great many puzzles that were never noticed until the first efforts were made to study eye languages carefully about 60 years ago. Uh, all of this is reminiscent of the earliest days of the modern scientific revolution. If you go back, say, to Galileo, uh, for millennia, scientists were very well aware that, say, if I'm holding a cup of boiling water and I let it go, the cup will fall and the steam will rise. Uh, but that wasn't considered a puzzle because there was a very simple explanation that uh, each of them is seeking its natural place. Uh, the best scientists, very good ones, for literally millennia had taken that to be the end of the story, so no puzzles. When Galileo and others 
permitted themselves to be puzzled by such elementary facts, modern science began. And it was, of course, quickly discovered that all of our intuitions about falling bodies or a great deal more are just completely wrong. Uh, the ability to be puzzled is a very important one to cultivate if you want to do serious inquiry. The world is full of puzzling phenomena, and if they don't look puzzling, you're, you're in trouble. They should look puzzling, and you should be bothered by them. Well, in the case of structural versus linear distance, uh, kind of a small industry has developed in the cognitive sciences, seeking to show that the answer can be given by sophisticated, usually Bayesian statistical analysis of raw data. Uh, every such effort has been easily demonstrated to be a failure, total and irremediable. There's no way to do it. In fact, this is interesting because it's one of the very rare cases where serious efforts have been made to show that acquisition problems can be solved by statistical analysis. Now, there is a very simple explanation which comes to mind at once, namely, universal grammar keeps to the optimal form of merge, to the simplest possible combinatorial operation, which leaves terms unordered. And so linear order is simply not available to the child who learns, la uh, learns language or to the adult who uses it. Uh, well, it's it, the internal computations is just not there. Well, of course, there is order. If you hear a sentence, the words are ordered. Uh, and that's a property of the sensory motor inter interface. We can't talk in parallel. So uh, there's got to be some kind of order and arrangement. And the plausible suggestion is that order and other arrangements are just reflexes of the externalization process, the interface, the sensory motor system. But they're not involved in the computations of language. And that has plenty of consequences. It would imply, for example, that uh, although hierarchy is clearly involved in a sense interpretation, complex interpretation, uh, semantic interpretation, and so on, uh, nevertheless, it, that order should never be involved. Uh, it looks surprising when you think of it for a long time. And it's not obvious. It's a, there are many complicated considerations arise. But it does appear to be true over quite a broad range. That's a very important fact about, and a non-trivial conclusion, about the basic architecture of language. Uh, in this case, there happens to be interesting independent uh, neurolinguistic evidence. There's a research team in Milan, which Andrea Moro over there was the linguist involved, who found that uh, in processing of nonsense expressions, uh, if they observe UG principles, nonsense expressions, nonsense language, but observing the principles of universal grammar, then the uh, normal uh, language areas of the brain are activated in the processing as expected. But apparently that doesn't happen for otherwise comparable expressions uh, formed or interpreted by a violation of UG principles. And the interesting case is reliance on order. So say, a nonsense language created in which negation, you negate a sentence by putting the negative particle after the third word, let's say, a very simple computation, uh, much simpler than the ones that are actually used in language. Uh, but apparently, and subjects can learn it, but apparently the uh, other areas of the brain are activated in the process, not just not the language areas. Uh, so we mean that uh, subjects are essentially treating this as a puzzle, uh, not as a language. Uh, and uh, as well known, language is dissociated from other cognitive capacities. There are some similar results uh, uh, found by Neil Smith and his colleague Yanti Maria Simply. Uh, they've been studying for a long time uh, an autistic savant, uh, Colin Christopher, has remarkable linguistic capacities, but very low cognitive and social competence. 
He's been their subject in a lot of illuminating work. And uh, they did some similar experiments with him and with normals. And they found that normals treated rules involving order, like say negation after the third world, treated them as puzzles, while Christopher couldn't deal with them at all, as expected, given his limited cognitive capacities. But similar nonsense structures, which satisfied Eugene principles, he could he learned just like any other language. Well, uh, observations like these suggest a much broader thesis, namely that the fundamental architecture of language, its design, if you like, uh, satisfies somatic, pragmatic principles, while externalization in one or another sensory modality is uh, just something secondary, secondary phenomenon, not essential to language in any way. Uh, so there's a, in traditional terms, uh, language is primarily an instrument of thought. Uh, language is audible thinking. It's what the 19th century linguist William Dwight Whitney, his formulation expressing the traditional conception. It's the spoken instrumentality of thought. It's a view incidentally uh, adopted by a number of distinguished contemporary uh, uh, biologists, uh, notably two Nobel laureates, uh, Salvador Luria and François Jacob. And as I mentioned, it's also Galileo's view. He took for granted that the sounds of language enable us to reveal our thoughts. That's what they're for. So language is basically a thought system uh, and uh, can be externalized. And in fact, if you introspect briefly, you'll quickly discover that uh, probably 99% of your language use is never externalized. And in fact, if you introspect a little more carefully, you'll notice that uh, you're not even conscious of what it is, and it's inaccessible to consciousness. Everyone must have the experience of uh, trying to say something. You know what you want to say, and you try to say it, and it didn't come out right. Or even to say it to yourself, try to think it, and it's not right. It doesn't capture what you meant. And you try some other way, and maybe you can never get there. Uh, that can only mean that there's something going on linguistically that's pre-conscious and inaccessible to consciousness, sometimes it can get as far as consciousness and sometimes it can get externalized. But all of that is secondary. Uh, again, these are topics that aren't much investigated because of another dogma, a modern dogma, that language is basically an instrument of communication. That's modern, it's not the traditional view. And I suspect also it's a reflection of behaviorist uh, preconceptions. It looks like, looks as though communication is just some marginal aspect of language. You can use it for communication, you can use it for internal thought, you can use it for lots of other things. Uh, well, uh, from the little we know about evolution, very little, it's plausible. I won't go into that. Well, then the, what well, can finish up, the child acquiring language doesn't face a puzzle in confronting data of the kind I mentioned, structural versus linear order. But the answer is supplied by the genetic component, by UG, and by language design. And the reason is a principle of minimal computation, kind of like cell division into spheres. Nothing to learn. Uh, if you take unordered merge, minimal computation, you just get these properties. Now, this is one of a great many examples, and they extend pretty far to problems of uh, interpretation and use of expressions, and I think they illustrate the kind of problem that ought to be addressed by a serious approach to the problem of language acquisition, and also the, the kind of contribution that can be made when that inquiry is uh, guided by careful attention to the principled approaches to the nature of the system. Uh, this should be uh, an exciting, there should be an exciting future of uh, inquiry that combines formal studies, experimental inquiry into acquisition of use, uh, 
uh, new opportunities for research that are coming along in the brain sciences as technology improves. And I hope that these few hints give some idea of two things, what might be achieved and what remains veiled in mystery, uh, perhaps forever. Thank you.